become king of the Jews. What is going on? And we see in this this, this principle that we see throughout the uh, uh, throughout um, the scriptures about the kingdom of God. That oftentimes your greatest victories are found buried through the hardest of times and the deepest of struggles. That this seed, the breakthrough and the deliverance or that next step or the, the, the kingdom of God is deposited in the seed form. And there's that scripture that says the seed must fall and die before it can ever grow. Right? And so we, we look at this, this principle that God was very intentional when he brought the Savior of the world in this, in this form. And if we look throughout Scripture, we see this happening over and over and over again. We see it with Noah, right? Do you know that Noah preached the flood coming for over a hundred years yeah. with nothing happening? Here he is preaching that this flood is coming. He built this boat for a hundred years. He's waiting and no rain. But he keeps doing it. He keeps going. And then one day, it starts raining. And it doesn't stop. We see it with Abraham. Abraham, the father of faith. He's called out of the foreign land, right? He's called out of his comfort, out of his family, to a foreign land by God. And then we see it again with Abraham again, right? Where, where he's asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. This, this son Isaac was the one that was promised to him. Remember, he was supposed to be the father of many nations, and he was promised this son Isaac, and then God told him, no, you have to sacrifice Isaac? And I think most of the dough know the rest of, of that story. We see, we see it with Joseph. Joseph is giving this dream, and then there's 17 years before, between the time when he gets the dream about his brothers and, and sisters and his mother bowing down to him. It's 17 years from the time he gets that dream to the time it actually happens. And in the midst of that, you see him left for dead, and then he's rescued. And then he becomes a slave, but then he's promoted all the way up to be the chief slave in the household. And then he's accused of rape, and then he's in prison, and then he's in prison, and he's helping people out in prison, and he's giving them, interpreting their dreams, and then one guy gets out, and he's in the king's court. He's like, hey, when you leave, don't forget me. And then he has to wait two more years before the guy who got out remembers, hey, Joseph's still there. <laughs> I mean, what a roller coaster ride. If you're looking at the natural, what a roller coaster ride. What the impossibility that Joseph has to be looking at throughout this whole journey. Yet God gave him this dream. God gave him this vision. God was calling him this direction. We see it over and over through Scripture. We see it with Gideon and his tens of thousands army reduced to 300. We see it with Moses leading the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt. We see it with Joshua, especially with Jericho, that the battle plan to defeat this mighty uh, 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 city and this massive uh, wall-encircled city is to walk around that city silently for six days and then on the seventh day walk around it seven times and then shout at the end. Yeah. We hear that story so many times, but... But let me, let, let's think for a moment. What, what has got to be going through their head on day six? Like, what is, has to be going through? They're like, what are we doing? Joshua thinks that God told him to do This is ridiculous. I don't think it's a coincidence that God's had them not speak for those six days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's the thoughts going through their head? And then boom, they shout and the walls fall. What seemed impossible a moment before, all of a sudden, is possible. Yes. We see that with, with David. We see that throughout Scripture, over and over and over again, this principle of this seed, or this thing, or this call, or this destiny that's placed out in front of you to chase after, for you to believe for, for you to go after, but then you're going to have to walk through the impossibility. It's like a tunnel with a light at the end of the tunnel. You have to walk through this dark tunnel, keeping your eyes on that light that's at the end. And it's not denying that the tunnel is dark, but it's keeping your eyes on the light at the end of the tunnel. And we see this principle over and over and over again. We see it in the birth of Jesus. That God has these two nobodies who, who are going to bring in the, the Savior of the world. He impregnates her before marriage. And so there's all those judgments and, and all those dirty looks and all those assumptions made, right? And then they have to go. And as she's, as she's eight and nine months pregnant, you, you have her showing up. You have her go on this 80-mile trip. And, and then she's, there's not enough room for this baby. And then she ends up, the Savior of the world ends up in a feeding trough. 
What are the thoughts going through their minds at that moment, right after he's born? And they're looking at that saying, did we get it wrong? I don't know. It doesn't say that in Scripture, and that might be inappropriate for me to infer that into, but I'm just trying to look at these people as real people. And all of us are real people, and I know many of us, God, God will speak to you, right? The scripture says that, that, that uh, my sheep will know my voice, and God will speak things to you, or, or let you know about things, or give you a prompting, or, or something. And you'll follow each and every person here. If you're truly living by faith, if you're truly living by faith, then you are in the midst of this right now, in some capacity. Big, small, uh, hard, easy, whatever it is. But if you're truly walking by faith, then you have to be believing for something that is not there yet. And so we see the story with Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Let's, let, let, let me phrase this. This, this might be a, a little hard, hard to hear, but I want us to be honest with ourselves. That... Scripture says that rain, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. What's that mean? It means good things are going to happen to good people and bad people alike. That's right. Right? And so, but then, we're supposed to have this response. We're supposed to look, walk by faith, right? We're supposed to have this blessed hope. And so, if we were to put side by side the life of an unbeliever and the life of a believer in Jesus, seeing rain fall on them, the same. Would we see a difference in the way they acted, in the way they talked, in the way they responded to those situations? I would like to think so, right? There's the scripture, I think it's um, it's First Peter um, chapter three. First Peter chapter three, right? And it says, um, gotta remember the scripture, I'm gonna tell you, right? No, it says, um, uh, what does it say? Well, I don't remember what it says. What was it saying? <laughs> no. Um, there's, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we see this, uh, this, this uh, revelation that's shared, right? That, that uh, as, as we're believers, the world around us will look at us as we're going through situations. They'll look at us. And the scripture says, be prepared to give account for the blessed hope that is in you. Right? So when the world around you asks the question, they see you going through a difficult circumstance, they see you and they look at you and they see, uh, why, why is he responding differently? That you're to be prepared to share why you go through life differently than somebody else. What is that blessed hope? But if we look at, at side by side, an unbeliever and a believer going through life, do we really see that? Are people asking you, what is that blessed hope? What is different about it? Why do you have this smile? Why do you have this positive attitude? Are we getting those questions? We see this as, as an opportunity. These times when, when we're called to live by faith, to go through these impossible situations, despite what we see, but we do it anyway because of faith. We see an opportunity for unbelievers to, to see that. But we also see an, un, uh, an opportunity for us to walk by faith. Scripture says that it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. And so these opportunities, these challenges, these difficulties, these impossible situations are opportunities for us to walk by faith. And that gives us an opportunity to be pleasing to God. Now we look at difficulty. We look at challenges. We look at obstacles and struggles from the wrong perspective. We're constantly looking at these challenges and, and, and just being overwhelmed by them. Man, that's the way the world sees it because the world can't do anything about it. They, they see an addiction, they see a problem, they see an issue, they see a relationship problem, and there's nothing that can really be done from it. There really is no true freedom. But in Christ, we have that freedom. We have that freedom. We have the blessed hope. And so we must, we must look different. We must go through life and respond differently and look differently. Otherwise, we won't be representing Christ. You know there's a study out of millennials, that's my generation, of millennials, and for the first time in American history, a generation sees religion and religious people more as a problem than a solution. How does that happen? Could it be... Could it be that we're not quite living up to the standard? We're not really living out the fullness of the gospel? And so when people look at us, they see judgment and condemnation and rejection and no? Yeah. 
Look, there's an absolute truth to Scripture. I'm not saying we compromise the truth of Scripture. But you know what Scripture says? It's the goodness of God that brings people to repent. Amen. Are we demonstrating that? There's supposed to be people asking us, what is this blessed hope that you have? Yeah. Are they asking us that? We have to look different than the world. Let's pull back. Let's pull back for a second. We see this going on. We, we know, okay, we need to live by faith. When we're going in those, those, those difficult circumstances, when we're going through those challenges, when we're going through those difficulties, okay, we need to keep our eyes on Christ, right? Last week we talked about putting off the old and putting on the new, that being a mindset, right? So we got to put on the new mindset. Okay, so when we're going through these challenges, when we're going through these difficulties, we need to keep our mind meditating on the things above, meditating on the Spirit, on the promises of God, right? And in that we see the solution to then see us response, that fruit made manifest in our life. But let's take a step back and look at this just as a Christmas story. Just Christmas. Now, let's take a step all the way back from what we just talked about and look at Jesus and Jesus' birth and his arrival here on earth. In the story of Jesus and his birth and his arrival, you see this principle laid out to the greatest extent. You see the greatest seed of the kingdom ever sown in Jesus. That for all of humanity up to this point, we saw the deplorability of mankind, murderous, right, and selfish, right? We see the, 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 the sexual immorality. We see the, the rejection of God himself. We see the worship of other gods. We just see this deplorable nature of mankind. And, Jesus, or, and God destines that through Jesus, through one seed, through one man's faith, through one man's life, through one man's sacrifice, it's going to change the destiny of all mankind. And Jesus had to humble himself, right? Jesus had to come in the form of a man. He had to leave heaven and come to earth and walk out as an earthly man. And then he had to go through the passion and then the crucifixion. Man, he had to go through and suffering. And there's that scripture that says, he suffered for the glory set before him. So in the Christmas story, in the giving of a son, we see the greatest seed deposit. We see this principle again, that, that, that God didn't come as a, a, a great announcement and, and an announcement to the whole world. He came as this tiny little infant in a feeding trough. And people would have to stretch to believe. People would actually have to, to desire a relationship, to find the truth. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, says this. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things in which are... Uh, I'm sorry. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the, thing which, the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ, Amen. who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness mm -hmm. and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. So we see the, the purpose in going through these troubles and, and being asked to walk by faith through these struggles. We see this happening as an example to the world around us. So they can ask, what is that blessed hope? We also see it as, as an opportunity for us to walk by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith, right? So it's an opportunity for us to walk by faith. Amen. And then we see it as a tool that God uses the crazy. God uses the unthinkable, the not likely. He uses that because in that you have the greatest yes. journey. People will look at it and say, that couldn't be you. That had to be God. And in that, God receives the most glory. Yes. And so when God sends the Savior of the world, when God says, sends the Savior of the world, He's desiring true disciples. He's desiring followers. He's desiring relationship. And so He doesn't announce this in neon lights in the sky and on Facebook. And He doesn't use that, right? He sends this 
to a it sends the sailor to a little town to be born through a couple of a nobody, to be birthed in a house with not enough room, and to end up laying in a feeding trough. Matthew chapter 13 says this in describing the kingdom. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. The man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the tiniest of seeds that's then deposited. And we know a seed must fall to the ground and die before it can be raised, right? That's scripture. So this mustard seed, this tiny little thing, this unlikely little thing, is deposited, and then all of a sudden, something starts to happen. For us, our role in that is to believe. Just like Mary and Joseph in the birth of the Savior, they believed and then they acted on that belief. Amen. Our job is to believe and then act on that belief. Amen. And then God will bring the freedom. God will bring the breakthrough. God will bring the solution. God will bring the answer. But this is a principle over and over and over shown in Scripture that it's deposited in the unlikely places and oftentimes, oftentimes it's buried in the most difficult challenges and the hardest struggles. And just like Jesus had to go through suffering, uh, through the passion, through, uh, through the cross, for the glory set before him, the glory set before you may have to go through suffering. It may be hard for a little while. It may be challenging for a little while. It's okay. Take heart. He has overcome the world. Yes. Yes. We're going to close with, with this scripture. Um, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 24. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. All have fallen short the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. We talk about the reason for the season. We talk about Christ in us. The gift that was given is Jesus. It's that salvation. It's that uh, taking away and removing of sin and restoring relationship back. It's us being made righteous before God. Not of our own doing, purely through what Christ did, but still, nonetheless, us being made righteous before God. So maybe for you, going through this difficult, uh, go, as you hear this message, you're, you're thinking of a difficult circumstance, a challenging dynamic, a relationship, or whatever that happens to be. Maybe, maybe that's what's speaking to you. Maybe that's the hardest thing that you're going through right now. It's choosing to believe what God says, despite what you see in the natural. Maybe for you the hardest thing to believe is that God truly does see you as righteous now. That through the blood of Jesus you are seen as valuable. You do have purpose. You do have destiny. You are made righteous. Maybe that's the hardest thing for you to believe. But this is the profound gift that's given to us through Jesus at Christmas. This is what we're celebrating. That despite the deplorable nature of man, the distance in which we separate ourselves from God because of sin, despite all of that, this tiny little infant is born into a feeding trough, into a challenging circumstance. And God uses that to bring salvation, righteousness, redemption, sanctification to the entire human race. So if we look back at that scripture that we opened with, a child is born, but a son is given. Yes, a child was born, but a son was given. We see it through the stories of scripture. We see it as, as the Simeon in the temple recognizes Jesus, as Anna the prophetess recognizes Jesus, 
in the temple. We see it with the wise men traveling 600 miles to come with frankincense, gold, and myrrh, which were gifts only given to ancient kings or kings that claimed to be deities. We see it with the shepherds coming in from the fields and seeing this little baby bowing down and worshiping and declaring the truth of him as Savior of the world. That even though for all of these people, all they saw in the natural was this little baby, this little toddler, or this newborn, they saw something more. They saw something more. I'm going to pray for you guys that whatever you're going through, whatever circumstance, whatever challenge it happens to be, that we'll refocus our eyes on that light at the end of the time, that blessed hope. All right? Afterwards, I'm also going to pray that Luke, Luke chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 10 said, wherever you are, preach the kingdom and heal the sick. That's, that's Luke chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 says, wherever you are, heal the sick and then preach the kingdom. So what I want to do is, we, we see this connection over and over through scripture. We see it in Jesus' life. We see that in his commands to his disciples and we see it in the disciples' life. This connection between preaching the word and the sign of God to confirm. So what I want to do is, if there's anybody here who has pain in their body, or they're going through that difficult circumstance, and they would just like that extra bit of prayer, man, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to, to stand here and, 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 uh, and believe with you to see healing and restoration for you to receive the fullness of that gift that was given. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I know most everyone in this room, but I, I want to make sure that we don't skip over this or not take advantage of this. If you don't know Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and you're like, I want that gift. Man, I would love to pray with you. I would love to stand with you in this moment. And be your brother, hold your hand as you enter into the kingdom. If you've left, if you got saved and you left, but you want to return, you want to come back home, you want to come back to this gift, you can come up. I'd love to pray with you as well. But I'm going to pray for you as a whole, and I'm going to come down over here. If anyone wants just additional prayer or something like that, I want to make that available to you. Jackie's going to close with the song, so we can do that during that, that closing song. I also want to say that, that Pastor David is going to be making uh, an announcement uh, about some stuff we're going to be doing at the new building. So after the final song, please don't leave. It's an important announcement. But I want to make this available to everybody here so we don't pass by. We don't come and ask for any comfort of God and then leave something on the table and not take advantage of it. You want to close your eyes for a pray. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you for the gift that is Jesus. Lord, at this time when we celebrate the coming and the birth of Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you for that gift. Lord, I pray as we go through this season, many of us have heard this story over and over and over and over again. God, I pray that we wouldn't get so comfortable with it that we would just glaze over the power of it. We wouldn't glaze over the opportunity of, of receiving your gift, receiving your goodness. God, I pray that you would peel us back like an onion, that this truth of the salvation of Jesus and that the Christ would, excuse me, of Jesus and the divine nature of his birth would be deposited even deeper in us. Lord, the revelation of, of walking by faith, despite what we see around us, would become even more real and even more a lively expression in our lives. We thank you for everything that you're doing. We thank you for everything you've done. And we ask that you move in our lives and bring restoration. 